I want to welcome you all um, to this uh, lecture. Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Bogues. I'm the director of the Center for Slavery and Justice. Uh, when uh, Professor Lundy Brown um, approached me a couple months ago um, uh, about thinking about questions of race and science, <coughs> Um, so, in fact, it's a conversation we have been having for a couple of years, if my memory <laughs> serves me right. Um, I said to her that the Center for Slavery and Justice really was very keen in uh, uh, trying to bring to campus and to uh, create, if you wish, the conditions and facilitate, a, if possible, a set of conversations around this issue. The reason you might ask is why Center for Slavery and Justice? What has that got to do with questions of race and science, race and medicine? And uh, the reason is, uh, uh, is really very simple, that we take the justice piece of the center very seriously. And the justice piece of the center means that we think very seriously about what I like to call the traces and legacies of racial slavery in the United States and generally in the world. And since we think that the questions of race, uh, which have to do, or which had were allied with questions of slavery, we see slavery as primarily racial slavery. Um, <coughs> then we also th that we think that the ways in which the questions of race plays out in medicine, in various fields of knowledge, in social life, in politics, and so on, are really very, very critical, and are not something that we should just put on the back burner, and are therefore, therefore are therefore issues which which we are preoccupied with. And so when we, sh we talked a bit, I said, absolutely, go ahead, and we will, um, we will have sponsored. Um, I also would like at this point to say that we were not the only sponsors, that when we, uh, after Professor Lundy and I spoke, that there was a conversation with Professor Tricia Rose from, um, from the, uh, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, um, and she also agreed um, that she would also sponsor, uh, sponsor this. So I would like to welcome you um, to this event. It is an event, um, one of the events of the Center for the Study of Race, uh, for the Study of um, Slavery and, and, and Justice. Um, you will see that we have many, many events next semester. Um, and um, you know, I just invite you to, to those events, and I also invite you to visit the center when you like. Join the undergraduate student groups that are doing stuff, and as well as as well as join the graduate student group that also um, does things. So welcome um, to this, and I turn it over to Lundy. I am really thrilled to welcome Professor Dorothy Roberts to the Center of Slave for Slavery and St the Study of Slavery and Justice today. Professor Roberts will talk to us about her latest work, analyzing the contemporary debate about race, health, and genetic difference. Importantly, her talk, entitled Race Medicine, Treating Health Inequities from Slavery to the Genomic Age, will link this debate to a longstanding <coughs> history, as Tony has just mentioned, rooted in slavery that is absolutely crucial for us to understand if we're going to make any impact on racial inequality and in health. Professor Roberts is a prolific legal scholar with remarkable breadth and depth of knowledge and interest. She's currently the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor, the George A. Weiss University Professor, and the inaugural Raymond Case and Sadie Tanner Maslow Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at Penn, where she holds appointments in the law school, the Departments of Africana Study, and the Department of Sociology. Before coming to Penn, Professor Roberts was on the faculty of Northwestern and Rutgers, and she's had many visiting professorships, among them at uh, Stanford and Fordham. And she's been a fellow at Harvard's university program in ethics and the professions. So you can just begin to get a sense of the breadth of her um, talents. Uh, her writings, lectures, and public statements have made her a public intellectual of truly the first caliber. Uh, and she has been, through this work, able to transform discussions and policy on reproductive health, child welfare, and bioethics. 
Her latest work promises, in my mind and that of many others, to transform the debate on racial inequalities in health and disease. Deeply committed to social justice, in addition to her academic work, she served on the boards of numerous um, organizations, and she's currently chair of the Black Women's Health Imp uh, Imperative. Professor Roberts' ac strictly academic com accomplishments are stunning, and I'm only going to touch on a few more in this brief introduction. So she's well known to uh, many of you for her award-winning books, Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, published in 1997, and Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, published in 2002. And I should just say that after nearly two decades, Killing the Black Body remains the key text in race and reproductive health, um, read widely in the academy and outside the academy. Her most recent book, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century was published um, by the New Press in uh, 2011, and I'm convinced this is going to join her other books as key texts in the field. In Fatal Invention, Ro Professor Roberts brought her formidable legal mind to bear on the race and medicine debate. A model of interdisciplinarity, and this is really an important um, point about her work, drawing on knowledge both inside and outside the academy. This book is carefully argued with meticulously gathered evidence and clear and incisive thinking. Accessible to the public, it's also beautifully written, um, something we're all grateful for when we're <laughs> sitting down and reading a book. It's an absolute must read for anyone interested in the intersection of race, gender, and class in contemporary health issues. Importantly, she locates, and doesn't back off ever from this, locates inequality in the social order, not in people's genes. Mm -hmm. This year, she has organized the Race, Science, and Society Workshop at Penn to promote interdisciplinary dialogue on the topic. I'm not gonna give away any of her argument, except to say that I use Professor Rose's book or articles in all, all my classes on health inequality, and I see students from the med school to undergrad um, here today, and I'm really thrilled um, for the wonderful turnout. Um, let me just conclude by thanking all of those who've made this talk um, possible, especially Tony Bogues, um, director of the Center for Study of Slavery and Justice, who, when I approached him, immediately saw the important connections and was enthusiastic about um, pursuing it. Um, this, as Tony mentioned, the talk is also sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, the Associate Provost for Diversity, the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, the Science and Technology Studies Program, and the Office of Medical Education. And then finally, just special thanks to Shana Weinberg and Ruth Clark, who um, who's, were absolutely marvelous to work with and they really made this, uh, this event go very smoothly. We are fortunate indeed that Professor Roberts has braved the East Coast <laughs> snow, she's from Chicago, so you know, there you go, to speak with us today. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor George. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, wow, this is a beautiful crowd, and uh, I'm so grateful that you came out to hear me speak. Uh, thank you, Lundy, for that wonderful introduction. I know to send you my next book for a blurb, because <laughs> you did a really good job on that one. <laughs> and um, and uh, Professor Bogues also, thank you for inviting me, and all the co-sponsors, I appreciate uh, your support. When I was researching my book, Fatal Invention, I spent an afternoon with a couple in Boston named Michael Bird and Linda Clayton in their apartment to talk to them about the history of race and medicine. They wrote a very meticulous two-volume treatise on uh, the history of African Americans' involvement in the healthcare system. <laughs> Sounded like Godfather music. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> this is a fit 
fitting, fitting for this talk because I will be talking about a lot of uh, very distressing things. Uh, <laughs> So uh, Dr. Bird and Dr. Clayton are physicians at Harvard, the Harvard School of Public Health, and um, they uh, have, are the le leading experts on this subject. In fact, at one point in the interview, we left their apartment where they live, and they took me down a couple stories to another apartment where they kept all their vast library of books about African American diseases and African Americans' involvement in the healthcare system, uh, what they call race medicine. So, put my first slide. Uh, Michael Byrd started the interview like this. He said, 246 years, or almost two thirds of our experience here in America, we were in slavery. So to understand African American health, you've got to know something about slave health. He went on to explain that enslaved Africans were treated by a separate and horrible slave health system, a subsystem within the healthcare system that either neglected their health, treated them only to benefit their masters, or subjected them to barbaric experimentation. Slavery established the way we do business in healthcare in the United States, Bird said. After a couple of hours of then recounting the next 100 years between 1865 and 1965, a period of blatant health segregation and discrimination. So you get it first, we've got the slave health subsystem, then we have a system of Jim Crow, uh, even in the North. Uh, segregation and separation. You know, I, I used to live in Evanston, Illinois. There was a separate hospital for blacks in Evanston, Illinois uh, during the time of Jim Crow in the South. Uh, so after that period, we finally get to the use of race in contemporary medical practice. And still today, medical students are trained to take race into account when they treat their patients. They are trained that when you see a patient, you put on the chart, the, you know, write down the sex of the patient, the age of the patient, and the race of the patient, and all of those are important in the, the diagnosis of the patient. Uh, that's race medicine too, Linda Clayton told me. Even if the instruments for measuring racial differences are more accurate and precise than they were at the time of slavery, even if the racial diagnosis is based on cutting edge genetic information, even if the researchers studying it and the doctors practicing it claim they have absolutely no racial bias, it's still racial or race medicine. So my objective tonight isn't to trace the details of the long history between slavery and today and how race medicine has been practiced over all those centuries, but uh, what I want to do, and let me just give you just some of what I'm, I don't have time to go into, but just some aspects of race medicine in the United States over the past centuries. Uh, what I want to do is to highlight how medicine has tried to treat social inequities and problems and injustices as if they were biological how this has functioned to make not only health inequities, but all racial inequalities seem natural and inevitable, and why it's no less troubling today than it was 300 years ago to practice race medicine. Now behind the practice of race medicine is an understanding of racial diseases. Defining disease in racial terms has played an essential part in a biological strategy to legitimize the racial order. The notion of racial diseases, that people of different races suffer from peculiar diseases or that they experience common diseases differently, okay, that idea is centuries old. As Lundy Braun explained so perfectly, and I, I love this quote, I use it all the time, <laughs> by locating disease in physiologic difference, be it susceptibility or resistance, 
medicine served to mark blacks as deserving of their inferior social status in society. White slaveholders argued that the biological peculiarities of blacks made enslavement the only condition in which blacks could be productive and disciplined. Now, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, uh, who graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, uh, <laughs> the university that I'm at now, was a well-known expert on Negro medicine. And he championed the claim that slavery was beneficial to blacks for medical reasons. He claimed that physical labor that white slaveholders forced upon blacks who were supposed to be naturally lazy and slothful didn't, it, you know, he didn't say it helped white people, it helped black people because it helped their lungs to what he called vitalize blood. He explained in a medical journal journal, quote, it is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their mind when under white man's contr men's control. And it is the want of a sufficiency of red vital blood that chains their minds to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. I know. Let me say that again. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <coughs> See, but people believed this because a doctor was saying it who examined the bodies of black people. If you just said, if anybody else said it, they might say, huh, that makes no sense. But if a doctor says it, and he, he gives an explanation that has to do with blood and lungs and all of that, then it sounds plausible. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. It is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their mind. Now, it's liber when they're made to work by white people. All right, when under the white man's control. And it is the want of sufficiency of red vital blood that chains their mind to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. Well, I'm going to show you some things from 2013 that <laughs> sound pretty much like that. Uh, but you know, if a genomic scientist says it, then it's accepted. But just wait, I'll get to that. By converting race into biological difference, Cartwright could ingeniously turn enslavement of Africans into a form of freedom and turn black freedom into slavery. After slavery ended, white scientists blamed the deteriorating health of the American Negro on the biological incapacity to adjust to freedom. A government psychiatrist, Era Evart, said after he became, and this is in 1913, after he became a free man, the conditions under which he must continue his progress become indefinitely harder. Locating blacks' inferior status in their diseased bodies provided a reason for retaining white supremacy and discredited the need for radical social transformation. This was a reason to end Reconstruction, was that black people's bodies were not suited for emancipation and it would be healthier for them to continue under the control of whites. So whites argued that the best way to improve the condition of emancipated blacks was through either benign neglect or coercive medical intervention. Now just as whites explained the symptoms of black oppression as caused by disease, they explained black resistance to oppression as a symptom of disease. And this is, as you see, the drapetomania, uh, that top disease that uh, Cartwright identified. He coined this term, drapetomania combines two Greek words, one for runaway slave and the other for crazy, to describe the mental disorder that caused blacks to flee plantations. And I'm going to refer back to Lundy Braun too. You cannot talk about race medicine during slavery without referring to Lundy's wonderful work in her forthcoming book, breathing race into the machine, she shockingly demonstrates that some of the beliefs, like uh, uh, beliefs that Samuel Cartwright had about lung capacity have traveled virtually unscathed. It's, a, it's not hard to 
I mean, you have to dig up the evidence like she did, but it's, you can see that the exact ideas are transported into the modern world, virtually unscathed till today. In the antebellum South, plantation physicians used a medical device called a spirometer to show that blacks had lung, lower lung capacity than whites. So remember, this was part of Cartwright's explanation for why, why blacks were healthier if they were enslaved. A mathematical adjustment to correct for race. Okay, so in this machine, you have to correct for race because black people's lung capacity is lower than white. So if you're testing a black person, you have to make an adjustment on it. And this became standard practice that continues to today. I could hardly believe my eyes when Dr. Braun pointed out at a talk at PEM uh, that invited her to. <laughs> <laughs> this is tit for tat, right? <laughs> Uh, she showed a slide. I should have. I should have asked her for the slide. I couldn't bring myself to ask her for the slide. But I had to, had this one showing this young lady, and there probably one of those buttons on there is a button for race. But on her slide, she she you could see the label. You there's actually a button. I swear to you that says race that you have to push to adjust for the race of the patient based on the theory that. If it's a, this black girl has lower lung capacity than any white person who is going to use the machine. It literally says race on it. Now, uh, in this front page, a cover story of the New York Times Magazine, uh, Sally Saitel announced as if she was saying something dramatic. I am a racially profiling doctor. <laughs> Illness isn't colorblind, so why is it taboo for doctors to take note of a patient's race? Well, of course, that's, it's not taboo at all. Doctors do take note of a patient's race. They're taught in most medical schools to take note of a patient's race. But she uh, wanted to defend it. And uh, she points out that she prescribes, she's a psychiatrist, and she prescribes Prozac at different doses to av her African-American patients and uh, her Asian patients and her white patients, all different doses. And there are just multiple, multiple examples. Um, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to point out that doctors do it, and there are many studies of some of the devastating consequences that come from doctors taking race into account. Uh, one famous one is Richard Garcia's uh, article in Pediatrics where he talks about a friend of his who, when she was two, the, her chart said two-year-old black female with fever and cough, and she continued to have this fever and cough when, for years. At four, again, it was four-year-old black girl with another pneumonia, and doctors continued to treat her for pneumonia, for coughs, for respiratory infections. Uh, and it wasn't until she was eight years old that a uh, technician looked at the x-ray without knowing she was black and said, who's the kid with cystic fibrosis? She had cystic fibrosis and was never diagnosed, even though she had the symptoms of cystic fibrosis, because the doctors thought that only white people have cystic fibrosis, that black children could not have it. Uh, and so she was mistreated, mistreated by doctors all those years because the doctor took race into account. And what often happens is, race then becomes even more important than the symptoms that the patient has. Another example of taking race into account is the low levels of pain medication that blacks and Latinos get. This has been replicated uh, over and over. Uh, there was a recent article in Pediatrics just maybe a couple months ago uh, look, and looking nationally and finding that black children uh, who are admitted into the hospital for severe abdominal pain get 
far lower doses of pain medication than white children. Just broke my heart to, to read that. And uh, counseling for the BRCA1 and 2 gene, uh, this is a study out of, uh, out of uh, Penn finding that African American women uh, were four times less likely to be counseled uh, about the BRCA1 and 2 gene even when they were clinically at risk of uh, breast cancer and, and the possibility of this, having this gene. Again, the myth that only Ashkenazi Jewish women or white women uh, could possibly have this gene, a black woman couldn't have it. Uh, it's just not true. But again, doctors practicing race medicine uh, who believe that people have different forms of diseases uh, because of race. Now, uh, oh, I wanted to mention that Sally Saitel had to issue an erratum, which I happened to discover on her blog, uh, because she said in that article that one of her associates, an anesthesiologist, uh, gives black patients a drying agent because blacks salivate more than whites uh, in administering uh, anesthesia. And she, Sally Sittel, had to admit that she could not find, and the people contacted her and said, this is just isn't true, and she couldn't find any evidence of it. But note, she says, despite finding that she was reporting a stereotype that just wasn't true, there are many other intrinsic differences, so this doesn't undercut the overall argument of, uh, of the article. In the protest psychosis, Jonathan Metzl traces how schizophrenia became a black disease in the 1960s. And, and here I want to I point out that, again, we have this idea of you know, racial diseases from slavery um, moving through the centuries. And, and I want to bring this a little closer to home to the 1960s and 70s, and just some striking examples of the practice of race medicine. Uh, so it became a black disease in the 1960s when psychiatrists began to explain black urban unrest as a symptom of mental instability. Schizophrenia was first considered a psychological malady that afflicted primarily white intellectual men and middle class housewives. But the race of the disease morphed, I mean just literally changed again before your eyes over the course of uh, a decade as the civil rights movement erupted. Metzl writes that many leading medical and popular sources suddenly described <coughs> schizophrenia as an illness <coughs> manifested not by docility, which is how it had been described before when applied to whites, but by rage and asserted that schizophrenia was a condition that afflicted Negro men and that black forms of this illness were marked by volatility and aggression. In other words, if, if, if a black person has schizophrenia, <laughs> it makes him hostile and aggressive. If a white person has it, it makes her, and it was mostly women, docile. Uh, in the 1960s, clerks literally crossed out the diagnosis of psychopathic personality on black patients' charts and replaced it with schizophrenia. And he shows these charts where they just, it's the same patient. But now schizophrenia is a black disease, so they cross out the old diagnosis and put in schizophrenia. It's the same patient, same symptoms. Conversely, the chart of a white woman originally diagnosed with schizophrenia paranoid type was changed to involutional melancholia. Black male accusations against the white power structure were diagnosed as signs of paranoia and hostility. Now, does that remind you of somebody? Uh, maybe drapetomania, the Cartwright, saying that the symptom of blacks wanting to, uh, that, the, the, that blacks wanting to flee the plantation, resist enslavement, was a symptom of mental illness. Similarly here, uh, black protest against white uh, domination and injustice was seen as a mental illness, as a, as a delusion. Uh, these men were described as delusional. Uh, because they thought that uh, white people were out to get them, basically. This history of concocted, oh, and by the way, this is just the kind of ads that accompanied 
the psychotropic drugs that were uh, prescribed, but you see the ads changed also to show angry black men who needed to be prescribed these, these uh, psychiatric medications. This history of concocted diagnoses reminds us that the understanding of disease in racial terms inevitably involves social understandings of race and reflects current debates about racial politics. Whites have turned their anxieties about race mixing, about overpopulation of people of color, immigration, resistance, and resistance into medical findings of minority disease that locate threats in the racial order in the bodies of subordinated people. And one of the examples of that is locating the problem of overfertility that supposedly caused uh, black poverty in the bodies of black women who were welfare recipients uh, with sterilizations by the North Carolina Eugenics Board, for example, going on all the way till 1973. Uh, again, morphing from sterilizations imposed primarily on poor whites and whites with disabilities to uh, poor uh, black women dependent on welfare benefits as the people who were being sterilized, uh, mandatorily sterilized by uh, this this board. Defining social inequities in biological terms makes them seem natural, the result of inherent racial differences instead of societal injustices. The seemingly biological concepts of fertility and schizophrenia are not natural conditions that are neutrally diagnosed and treated by medical experts in hermetically sealed clinics that you know, have no, are influenced at all by the rest of society. Rather, they're pliable and porous containers fashioned by medical experts under the influence of racist stereotypes, government policies, and political debates circulating in the broader society. Stating these judgments as objective scientific facts is precisely what hides their ideological function. Medical professionals have played a critical role in implementing the biological strategy of social regulation. Well-respected members of the mainstream medical establishment, like Samuel Cartwright was at his time, he was, well, he was brought to Louisiana as an expert to <coughs> conduct this study of Negro diseases. And he was published you know, in, in uh, prominent journals. And today, well-respected members of the mainstream medical establishment in hospitals, mental institutions, and prisons <coughs> were responsible for inflicting atrocious injuries on their patients well into the 20th century under the guise of helping them. Doctors who confined black men for schizophrenia in the 1960s and 70s claimed they were protecting inner cities from urban disorder and urban unrest. Doctors who sterilized thousands and thousands of black and Latino women without their consent during this exact same period believed they were protecting the public welfare by reducing fertility rates. Now, some people think that the 1970s is ancient history, uh, and so now things are so different than they were. This would never happen, because I guess there's been some kind of dramatic change uh, in our so society. Uh, but in case you think it could never happen, uh, just in July, a reporter named Corey Johnson published an investigative report on unapproved sterilizations of women in California prisons. And the doctor who was in charge of all of this, Dr. James Heinrich, said he provided an important service to poor incarcerated women who faced health risks in future pregnancies. He described the $147,460 spent on sterilizations in California state prisons as minimal. He said, quote, this, this is what he told the reporter, over a 10-year period, that isn't a huge amount of money compared to what you save in welfare, paying for these unwanted children. 
as they procreated more. She so felt it was fine to say that to a reporter. Because that's how many people think. They're doing a service to society and to these women by sterilizing them. It's precisely their position of assumed professionalism, objectivity, and benevolence that makes doctors especially formidable purveyors of racial control, for it grants them permission for practically unrestrained inhumanity. What would ordinarily be deemed illegal assaults in clear violation of constitutional, constitutional and human rights, forced sterilizations, indefinite confinement without due process, that's what happened to men in this mental institution outside of Detroit that were brought in from the streets of Detroit into the mental institution. They were confined there, no trial, you know, no criminal trial. They were there because of their schizophrenia. And it was up to the doctors to decide if they could get out. So, you know, they said one angry thing. You're going to spend, okay, you're in here another year. And that was put in their record. If they said, what am I doing in here? Nothing's wrong with me. Patient suffers from delusions, I, you know, and hostility. Requires electro shocks and more medication. We're doing it for their own good. So the involuntary confinement and the involuntary administration of mind-altering drugs, all of that becomes legitimized by the medical profession, not only as remedies for social problems, but maybe more insidiously as for the victim's own benefit. Now, unfortunately, in case you might think we're in a new era where this would never happen again, a new development in scientific research and biotech development is reinforcing the practice of race medicine in the genomic age. Uh, some people thought that with the unveiling of the human genome uh, map, uh, where Clinton said it showed that all human beings are 99.9% .9 the same and there was going to be a new science of human genetic diversity, those uh, old racial categories that were seen as innate, scientists wouldn't use those anymore. They would think creatively about another way to do their research without relying on supposedly natural divisions of human beings into races. But just a year after Clinton made that comment, Nicholas Wade predicts that the next phase of the Human Genome Project is to look at the genetic differences between human races, assuming that there are such a thing as biologically distinct human races and that there are identifiable genetic differences between them and that this is what scientists should be looking into. This is the important next step of the Human Genome Project. Countless research projects at universities and biotech firms around the country and around the world are studying racial differences in disease and searching for the genetic causes of racial health inequities. Disparities in asthma, infant mortality, diabetes, cancer, HIV, hypertension, kidney disease, I could go on and on, and, and there are differences in the prevalence of these diseases and the severity of these diseases along racial lines. Question is, what is causing that? Is it some innate genetic predisposition? Well, there are many scientists that are looking for that gene or those genes that are different in people of different races that explain why there's a different prevalence of these diseases along racial lines. And all of these have been attributed in the scientific literature in recent articles, you know, like in 2013 to genetic predispositions that vary according to race. Now, one, I'll just, I, I don't have time to go into all of them, but let me just focus on one, which is infant mortality. There has always been a gap in infant mortality. This is the rate of children who die before the first year, babies who die. And the rate has <laughs> always been higher for black people since black people were brought here in chains 
you could imagine that during the period of slavery, there would be a higher rate of infant mortality among enslaved Africans than among whites. Uh, and there continues, that continued, but uh, in fact, it has increased since the 1950s. The gap has increased since the 1950s. So we now have uh, infant mortality over twice uh, the rate in, in among blacks as among whites. Now, what explains this? Well, one team of researchers looking at all births in Missouri between 1989 and 1997 wanted to test the hypotheses that black race, independent of other factors, increases the risk of extreme preterm birth and its frequency of recurrence. And I was saying to Professor Braun before, I, I can make it on time if I don't stop. What any, this is the slide I could stop and talk about for an hour because it's so, what is black <laughs> race? What, no, what is black race? What do, they, what do they mean by black race independent of other factors? And why, why would you hypothesize that something called black race independent of other factors increases the risk of preterm birth. Like, what would, would give you that idea? How is this any different from what Samuel Cartwright was doing? What, is there something about belonging to the black race, but independent of, other, what they mean by independent of other factors, is anything social. It means there's something innate in black race which assumes then, if it's innate in black race, that black race must be some biological category. But do they define in the study what that is? No. They, people self-identify whether they're African American or not in the study. Well, how do you know if somebody belongs to the black, this supposedly biological black race? How do you measure that? How do you tell? Who qualifies? Do you qualify if you have four, three out of four grandparents who don't belong to the black race? One does. Why would then that one quarter amount of belonging to the black race cause the same extreme preterm birth as somebody who has three quarters? You know, I mean, they don't answer any of these questions. Then they control for socioeconomic status by controlling for food stamp and WIC receipt. What? Yes. OK. <laughs> also, of course, they find that there's still right, a, a difference among the black women in the study. And so they say that their findings suggest a probable genetic component that may underlie the public health problem presented by the racial disparity in preterm birth. Notice that you know, they leap to a conclusion that it's probably genetic. And they don't, you know, they don't say that preterm birth has a genetic component. They say that the health disparity has a genetic component. I mean, sure, preterm birth may have some genetic component to it. Some, yeah. But th that doesn't mean it's the explanation for why black women are more likely to have preterm births than other women. Now, uh, in case you might think, despite all the flaws in that study, that they were right, uh, there are other studies, and here's just one of them, that raise questions about that. If it's some innate genetic difference in the black race that causes it, why is it that African-born women do not have this problem. It's only women who've lived in the United States who have this, black women who've lived in the United States that have this problem. And they conclude that it's not readily explained then by genetic mechanism, but rather suggested the negative effects of minority status are cumulative through the life course from fetus to childbearing women. Much more likely to explain, uh, much more likely explanation is that there's <coughs> something about living in America as a black woman that leads to a greater 
likelihood of preterm birth. Oh, wait, let me just hold on one second. <coughs> uh, now, until recently, virtually every study of black hypertension accepted the premise that blacks have higher rates of disease than whites because of inherited susceptibility. In volumes 27 through 30 of the scientific journal Hypertension, published in 1996 and 1997, 30 articles hypothesized the existence of innate physiological differences between racial groups, and that the reason why black people in America have higher rates of hypertension is because, uh, just like that other hypertension, there's something about the black race that predisposes people to hypertension. A landmark 2005 study led by Richard Cooper contested this conventional wisdom. He looked, he did a meta-analysis of a number of studies of blacks from Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States, and whites from the United States, Canada, and Europe that collectively enrolled more than 85,000 participants. And doing all the calculations, he figured out that white populations on average, globally, right, have a substantially higher rate of hypertension than blacks, globally. Again, it was only the blacks in the United States that had this high rate. Nigerians had the lowest rate of hypertension of any group in the study. Uh, and Germans had the highest. All right, that's not what you would expect if there was something inherent in the black race, right? Okay, but you really have to credit some of these racial scientists with ingenuity. <laughs> How are you gonna challenge that? Here's what comes out last year. Big spread in the New York Times. This was half the page in the Science Times. Genomic study points to adaptation in early Africa. It was after blacks came as slaves to the United States that their gene pool changed <laughs> to predispose them to hypertension and forms of cancer. Uh, for some reason, the, white, the Europeans didn't experience this, even though they also confronted the harsh environment. But the, it was the new environment in the United So that's why Nigerians can have lower rates of hybrid. It's only the genetic change that happened after Africa. That's why I told you I would show you things that are just preposterous. But because it was published in a scientific journal, the New York Times gives it this huge, huge attention, and many people will look at this, and it confirms their view that black people are bio, a biologically distinct race that, and for genetic reasons, are predisposed to more severe forms of common illnesses uh, than whites in America it has nothing to do with racism, social inequality, discrimination. It's all about innate genetic predisposition. <coughs> so uh, it is the case, as I said, that there are these stark differences. In health. Well, sometimes, you know, you look at, look back and look at the study, some of these, oh, is it, okay. Uh, they're not as stark as sometimes they're presented to be. Uh, for example, the idea that blacks don't benefit from ACE inhibitors. Uh, that is a misinterpretation of studies that find some differences, but it's turned into a categorical uh, statement that black people can't benefit, but white people do benefit from this particular form of drug. And the way I explain it is that race isn't a biological category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic difference. Race is a political category that does have staggering biological consequences, like extreme preterm births, but that's because of the impact of social inequality on people's health. Okay, now I have to go a little bit faster because I don't have much time left, but uh, 
this idea that blacks have suffer a, a different form of common diseases has now been incorporated in, medicine, in, in pharmaceuticals. Uh, the FDA in the Food and Drug Administration in 2005 approved the first race-specific drug. Uh, this is a combination of two generic drugs that uh, dilate the blood vessels and therefore provide relief for patients with uh, heart failure. <coughs> and uh, the drug was not developed for black people. It was developed for anyone who could benefit from it. But to make a long story short, there was a commercial advantage uh, to getting a patent which specified that it was for a particular racial group. Uh, because the cardiologist had already gotten a patent without any race, the same drug, without any mention of race, it was going to expire. He needed a new claim to get a new patent for the same drug, which is made up of generic components, no, nothing specially developed for black people at all. And so he patented it as a drug for African Americans. The FDA approved it as a drug for African Americans based on a clinical trial that only included African Americans. <laughs> now, the explanation, even though there was no genetic research done whatsoever in developing this drug, the explanation became it, was, it worked on black people because of some genetic uh, Factor that made them uh, black, that, that makes uh, heart failure different in blacks, and also that makes this medication work for them. The FDA couldn't explain what that was, but it just said it exists, <laughs> and uh, therefore we're going to make the drug available to uh, African Americans. The chair of the FDA advisory committee was more explicit and said <laughs> that we're using self identified race as a surrogate for genetic markers. Uh, now, one of the, uh, the ways of addressing the clear problems in having a drug, marketing a drug for a particular racial group, the fact that that, that reinforces the idea of innate biological differences among races and, and, and that human beings are naturally divided into biological races. But the way in which black advocates and doctors who supported Bio uh, addressed that was that this was a remedy for medical wrongs committed on blacks. This was a way that the federal government could uh, make up for that. Uh, this is all happening at a time when race is seen as not, by many people, including a majority of people on the U.S. Supreme Court, as not mattering to society anymore. That we should be colorblind because there is no more racism in America. Uh, and so at a societal level, we should not pay attention to race. But as, remember, the same Sally say, tell the racial profiling doctor? She <laughs> says the social phenomenon of race is, what con is just constructed. We shouldn't pay, we, there should be no affirmative action. There should be no um, efforts to address racism in society. But biological race is different. That's the race that Bido, uh, uh addresses. And that's what is important to pay attention to. So it's, you know, I'm giving this whole lecture to show how biological explanations for social uh, injustice, uh, how they mask racism. She just basically comes out and says that what's important is the biological race. Social race isn't important. It just twists what is true that, you know, that <laughs> racism is what we should be concerned about, what causes these inequities, and we should be fighting against the notion of biological race. Now, at the risk of sounding alarmist, I feel I should add that race medicine has functioned not only to obscure the need for social change, but also to justify, and I think I've shown this in several places in my talk, aggression and atrocities against racialized groups of people. 
Some people say we have nothing to fear. We live in the most free and liberal and democratic country in the world. These things could never happen in America. Uh, but I want to remind you that we, America currently imprisons African Americans at a, a rate higher than anywhere else in the world, higher than incarceration rates in the Soviet gulags and in apartheid South Africa, and higher than any Western democracy has ever incarcerated people. It puts children in adult prisons and detains thousands and thousands of children in horrific uh, juvenile detention centers, at, which are extremely uh, rife with racial bias. Uh, it runs a huge detention center uh, in Guantanamo Bay where hundreds of people of color have been held indefinitely without trial and many without even any charge brought against them. It lets suffering people die in overcrowded emergency rooms in poor black and Latino neighborhoods. LA County Prison, LA County Jail, I don't have time to explain, but they are intimately connected with each other. Uh, and uh, in some states, as you have probably read, have refused to expand Medicaid, cutting even more, even more health care available to the poor. And to add to that, myths and stereotypes about innate racial differences in intelligence, in criminality, in personality persist. And so when a, a biologist claims to have found a gene that causes gangbanging, <laughs> This is how the Associated Press, this is the picture the Associated Press uses to report that study. In one picture showing the stereotypes about who is a gangbanger, which then leads people to say, well, they're gangbanging because they're genetically different, right, from people who don't gangbang. And the people who gangbang are blacks and Latinos. And it also then adds in this picture the solution, which is harsh confinement of people who are genetically predisposed to be violent, to be criminal, to not benefit from education. I know people will say, oh no, health is different. But I hope I've shown so many examples where dif racial differences in disease are seen as intertwined with racial differences in violence and criminality. Again, think about schizophrenia. Think about uh, the sterilizations of women in prison. They're, they're, they inevitably are brought together. And they come from the same idea that human beings are naturally divided into races. The only reason to believe that, in my opinion, is to support Racism. There's no other reason to believe that. There's no other reason to divide human beings that way. It's invented. It's not natural at all. So I'm going to close with an admonition that instead of going down this path, which I think is going to end with more of this for more people, is to affirm our shared humanity by working to end the social injustices that are preserved by the political system of race. And let me just, I just want to also say, I am not saying that all geneticists and all doctors are evil people who want to support this system. I am <coughs> calling on people in the biological sciences, as well as the social sciences and the humanities, doctors, lawyers, everyone who cares about our common humanity and social justice to join in affirming our common humanity. I think that geneticists and doctors can do that just as much and have done it just as much. So it's not to slam those professions, it's to point out how those professions have been used in particular ways to promote a particular strategy of obscuring and continuing uh, social injustice in this country and around the world.
do have time for questions, so I would like to open the floor to discussion, and perhaps you could just field the questions. And I'll try. <laughs> right. and instead of me. Okay, okay. <laughs> questions, comments? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming today and talking to us about this. Sure. Uh, you sort of mentioned commercial advantages, and I just yes. wanted to expand on that question by asking um, about the people who is who are producing this knowledge. Yes. Is it easier for these people to gain funding, or is it like easier yes. to receive funding if yes. you've demonstrated the ability to produce this type of work, or is it like easier to get tenure? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Where's it coming from? Well, there is definitely a premium placed on genetic research, both in terms of prestige, in terms of funding. Uh, Nancy Krieger, I don't have the exact figures in my head, but Nancy Krieger did a review of um, NIH funding and found that, you know, that there was the, the studies that have genetics in them <laughs> have tons more funding than the ones that look at racism, for example. Um, and so uh, if you can also see it in, again, I haven't done a study of it, but just my impression of the kinds of uh, studies that get reported in the New York Times, for example. Um, there's, uh, especially Nicholas Wade uh, loves these studies that report uh, to supposedly have found genetic differences uh, among races and at genetic explanations for all sorts of racial differences. Um, then, so there's there's the government funding uh, at NIH, and you can you can go on uh, line and look at the programs that NIH funds, and there's uh, more and more and more centers that have genetics and genomics in the title. Uh, then there's the commercial aspect of it, which increasingly influence influences university research. Uh, and, you know, many universities uh, are looking for more of this because it's very lucrative if a university professor uh, patents a blockbuster drug <laughs> and it's, it's helpful to have a connection to the pharmaceutical industry to do that. And so uh, biotech and at the biotech and pharmaceutical industries, which are some of the most lucrative industries in the United States, uh, you know, up there with gas and oil. I mean, I think pharmaceuticals is usually one of the top three profit-making industries in the country. So there's lots of money in it. And certainly, there's more money to be made in producing a drug to, uh, to address asthma, for example, in poor black and Latino communities, then, and by the way, there is research being done looking for the gene that causes more severe asthma in black and Puerto Rican communities. Uh, more money in that than in addressing the structural reasons why there's more asthma in those communities. So um, that's another commercial advantage. Now, what about, where does race come into it? Uh, in the case of Bidel, race allowed the company to add a claim, well initially the cardiologist, but if the cardiologist is gonna produce this drug, the cardiologist has to get a, a firm to s license this drug to manufacture it and market it. That's how, as this, I, I was in a debate with this cardiologist, actually, Jay Cole, and he said, he said, Dorothy, what do you want me to do? How else am I going to distribute my drug? I have to pay attention to commercial aspects of it. That's how drugs, in fact, he said to the audience, Dorothy wants to change the way that drugs are made and distributed <laughs> in the United States. And, you know, she gets, she does that. I can just make a drug that will help people, but I have to patent my drug. I have to find a company that is going to manufacture and sell my drug. The only way that's going to happen is if there is some claim, unique claim, so 
so that only my company can make that drug. That's the only way you're going to make money. And race provides a claim that you can make, that people will believe, as the FDA advisory committee believe, has a biological basis to it. And unfortunately, that many people in the public believe. So what, what we're finding is that even gene tests that look for a gene or that test some biologic mechanism, where race doesn't matter. You're testing the, per the patient if they have the gene, if they have the enzyme, you know, they have the mechanism. Race helps to sell it. It helps to say, this is a test for black patients, this is a test for white patients, this is a test for Latino patients, this is a test for Asian patients. It seems that people believe it works better. <laughs> They're more likely to believe it works. It's, it's for you. It's, it's made for me if it's for people of my race. It's very interesting because I think just the opposite. Somebody tells me I'm giving this to you because you're black. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's, that's you know when 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 the FDA approved Bigel in its press release, it said this is the first step toward personalized medicine. That is a quote from the press release from the FDA. Personalized medicine is supposed to be prescribed according to your unique genotype. So how could it possibly be that a, ra that a drug prescribed to me because of my race is personalized? As I said before, often treating the patient by race overwhelms the individual symptoms and other aspects of the patient it becomes the most important thing about the patient. And doctors will ignore symptoms right there before their eyes because of the patient's race. So, <laughs> sorry, long-winded. But yeah, so commercial aspects affect so many, so many aspects. It's really, it, it's a, a very um, complicated, uh, combination of the, the, um, the popularity of genetics plus racial thinking plus commercial incentives that all come together to promote these kinds of race specific products. I, um, I thank you for coming to speak with us. Sure. Today. I'm a second me second year medical student yes. here at Brown. And, um, Were you taught to pay attention to race? Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> the, the best example of that is pulmonary function testing. Um, mm -hmm. We are taught to take that into account. The hospital is affiliated with Brown. Um, there's that button when you do the See? Thing, I'm not making this up. <laughs> we have. You push the button. Yeah. It cycles through white, black, Hispanic. about what does it mean if even if that that I'm going to push that when I push the button it's going to give me a different reading for a patient who's black versus a patient who's white but like, even the question of how do you how do you you have to tell the machine if your patient's black <coughs> or white or Hispanic right so even that is there a discussion about 
well, who belongs to these groups? Mm -hmm. and, and it's usually and done by the clinician. <laughs> so you don't even ask most of the time for the person to self-identify. You are expected to just it's, choose. Right, those. that's another one. Exactly. So I mentioned self-identification where the patient or the research subject states their race, which is very common in, in research. But I, I, I think you're right, in doctor's <laughs> offices, the doctor just looks at the patient and determines the patient's race. So there's that issue of, you know, what, how does the doctor determine the patient's race? But also, what does it even mean to determine a patient's race? I mean, I don't want to assume that there's some correct way that, to determine the patient's <laughs> race. It's that the very exercise of placing a patient in a racial group relies on some social definition of what that racial group means. And so what, to just to get doctors, I think there would be a, just a great exercise just around that machine to think, get the, now you've got to have the professor who's willing to engage in this. But you know what, more and more, I think students need to get together and say, because I've talked to lots of groups of medical students on um, this topic, and they come up to me afterward and say, you know, I used to think that way in college. <laughs> I was taught in college that race was socially constructed, and you know, I know in my everyday life that it's a social category, uh, but then when I got to medical school, <laughs> I was taught that it's a biological category, and I have to identify the race of my patients. And, because they have to pass tests that test them on this, they have to please their professors, you know, they go along with it, but I found a lot of students are really, are troubled by it, and they, they want to, um, they want to engage about it, and, uh, and it may take, you know, organizing by students to demand some interrogation of this, because, it's, there are harms caused by it. And it, it, you know, directly to patients, in addition to these broader social harms that, that I've been talking about. Uh, so that, I think one is students getting organized on this, and also people who are concerned about the role of race medicine, uh, approaching medical schools. Uh, UT, University of Texas at Austin is gonna build the first medical school on that campus. And I and a group of uh, other uh, researchers who have been working in this field of uh, the resurgence of biological concepts of race, we organized a conference there uh, to try to have some input on what the curriculum is gonna be in this new medical school. Uh, now, I don't know what success it'll have, but at least just the first step has to be to say, we're going to challenge this. And, and it, it's going to require collaboration of people inside and outside of medicine because there's this, this feeling uh, within medicine, you don't, un we're the experts, don't you, you know, social scientists come and tell us how to practice medicine but an openness to interdisciplinary collaborative attention to this and an understanding that it's not good medical practice to rely on racial categories. I think that can also make a difference. You know, this is not good medicine. It's not just unjust, it's not good medicine. One more. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll do uh, raise a question about this, uh, and I think you've gotten it 100% right. This is, was brilliant. And I have a question. I think there is, in fact, a biological reality to, to races. The issue is that that's a very common term used to all animals, plants, other things. The issue gets complicated and dicey when you deal with humans. So a race in evolutionary and genetic terms is a population of animals or plants living in a particular area. And we now can use genomics to identify unambiguously that they happen to have spent thousands or millions of years in a geographic location. So there are genetic differences between races. The issue gets complicated in humans because race is a social construct. But there are, I guess my question for you, I think you got it 100% right, but I think Satel, is it? Who? Yeah. I think she got it 100% right too. The question is there are biological bases and genetic bases to 
these diseases and medical treatment. But, and another example, let's say Asians uh, often have an allele uh, that is a low activity of alcohol dehydrogenase and they're susceptible to intoxication. It's not that they're Asians, it's because they are from an area where that allele is in high common. So I think, no. No, I, that's exactly the very con again. The very concept of who an Asian is is completely historically contingent. Who is considered Asian? That's exactly my comes point. out of then. Okay, but then it's not. It can't be complicated by. But there are populations where there are genetic differences. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about race in America. We're talking about these big socially constructed groups that where it was invented to even create them and the divisions among them are invented and changed and that's what I'm talking about. It, to me, to then bring up that, well, there are genetic differences between certain populations, that's not what I'm talking about. No, I completely that's not what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> well, I guess the question is about the... Um, the biological basis, and I think you're absolutely right, the biological basis, the genetic basis. Personalized medicine is a perfect example because it really is your individual personalized genome. We lectured on this in my evolution class last Friday that the greatest difference is the greatest is the difference among individuals, yeah. not among racial groups. Right. And yeah. that's where personalized medicine, so I, you, that's absolutely. why you are right and, and absolutely, absolutely. Satel is 100% right. But, but I think the issue gets no, dicey because. Well, you're predisposed because you're black or something like that. Yeah. My own family. Right. So I'm wondering, right. is there any kind of cohort of doctors, uh, you know, that understand what you're saying and have, you know, that I can locate? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't even have. Every time they ask me if you have primary care physicians, I'm like, no. And I have a privilege for passing as something else. So they always ask me, so what are you? And I, you know, now I'm white, like, because I don't want you to categorize me as anything else and tell me I'm predisposed to something. So I'm wondering. <laughs> study that uh, the Collins and uh, um, oh, sorry. these people, Richard David and James Collins, okay. those are both, do they're doctors in Chicago, I'm not, I'm not recommending them to you. <laughs> <laughs> they're doctors in what used to be called Cook County, well, Richard David is Cook County Hospital, James Collins is, I think he's at Northwestern now, but they're they are uh, doctors who are dedicated you know, to social justice, to refuting the myth of biological races. Uh, that's why they conducted this study. They, they, they have patients, they also do this research. And um, they, and there's a group of them in Chicago. I don't know, just as an example, if they have some network, like you, you yeah. just know who they are, that's, I don't know. A um, future, you know, doctors exactly, like Exactly, exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> See, I think, you could I think, oh, of course I would have to do that. It would, it's, would, it's, it's so, <laughs> I would love, that would be so useful, because as I'm putting together this program on race, science, and society of Penn, I want to know who are the medical researchers the genomic and genetic researchers you know, who are willing to say race is not a natural division among human beings. It's a political system. You know, who are willing to say we are fighting, we are anti-racist <coughs> fighting for social justice. You know, who don't think that there's some contradiction between being a scientist and being an advocate for social justice. Science are genetically you know, predisposed. Yeah. Uh, I think that they they're there, and I, and there probably are. I don't want to say that there are no organizations of those, but I think 
it would be it would be so great right now if there were a group of biomedical researchers, geneticists, physicians who had an organization on this particular issue, you know, opposed to race medicine. Um, and if anybody knows, <laughs> maybe you'll do some research on this too, email me and let me know because I would love them to be part of this organization um, that, I'm, that I'm developing at Penn. Uh, I, I, I gave a talk once about that organization uh, and there was a grad student in genetics there and he said, well, your organization is too exclusive. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you put on the slide that you have to believe that race was not a natural division of human beings. And you have to b believe in our common humanity. And you have to advocate for social, you know, at least one social justice. <laughs> and he said, he said to me, now I, I know I couldn't believe this. I think he was wrong. He said to me, no geneticist here would join an organization like that. So I can't believe, I just cannot believe that's true. I cannot believe that's true. Because geneticists were some of the scientists that fought against the idea of innate racial distinctions. Uh, and so it's, I just don't believe they're not out there. It would, again, be helpful to have organizations like that, that explicitly are on that, that mission. And same thing in, in medical school, which you could go to, to come to speak you know, at medical schools, for example, to, to strategize on how to affect the medical school curriculum.